Well, welcome. Thank you to, for coming to my show. This is outrageous. I, I wasn't expecting so many people. This is amazing. So thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the ocarina and playing some more music for you. Um, I thought a good way to start out would be to, to talk a little bit about the history of the instrument. Um, ocarinas belong to a family of instruments called vessel flutes. And these have actually been around for a very long time. Uh, vessel flutes have been around for about 12,000 years and they originate all over the world. So the ocarina is truly an instrument that's, that's from everywhere. In China, about 7,000 years ago, there was an instrument called the shun, which was egg-shaped and had a, a hole across the top. And you would get the sound by, by blowing across the top, kind of like the way you blow across a bottle. And in India, about 6,000 years ago, there were whistles and clay flutes made out of uh, terracotta that were in the shape of birds and other animals. And in Europe in the 15th century, there was a very interesting instrument called the gims horn, which was basically an ocarina made out of a, an animal horn. Um, so we, you see examples of, of instruments kind of from everywhere that are all kind of the, the same thing. In Mesoamerican cultures, the Aztecs and the Mayans also had clay vessel flutes that were shaped like birds and animals. And I think it's really interesting because even today you see um, ocarinas that are shaped like animals and birds and so they really are kind of timeless. Um, we, it's impossible to know what the earliest music would have sounded like on vessel flutes but we do know that music was a very um, important part of a lot of these cultures spirituality so I think that probably a lot of the music that they would have played would have been reflective of the sounds that they heard around them in nature. So. Um, a smaller ocarina has a very high-pitched sound, kind of a, a bird-like sound, which is appropriate. And a larger ocarina that has a, a larger chamber is going to have a deeper tone. So a tenor or a bass ocarina is going to have a very soft, mellow, kind of a cooing sound. It's very easy to, to emulate the, the sounds of, of birds um, on ocarinas. Uh, when I first started playing the pendant, I used to sit with my window open and, and try to get the morning doves that would coo outside to, to call back to me. And eventually I got so good that eventually they, they started doing that. And it really makes you think because if people had vessel flutes thousands of years ago, then who knows, maybe somebody was doing the same thing 6,000 years ago. So, with a little bit of imagination, you can turn a, a simple song into something beautiful. The great ironies of the ocarina is that even though vessel flutes have been around for many thousands of years, the modern concert tune fully chromatic ocarina called the classical ocarina or ocarina di Budrio from where it was invented has a very relatively short history compared with many other traditional instruments. Uh, vessel flutes first made their way to Europe when Cortez uh, brought some Aztec musicians and dancers and they performed on their vessel flutes in the, the courts of Spain and from there, the ocarina gained a lot of popularity as a toy musical instrument across Europe. And in a way, this is kind of unfortunate. It's good that it made it to Europe, but it's kind of unfortunate because a lot of really beautiful music was being composed during the Renaissance, Baroque, and Classical periods. 
And during this entire time, the ocarina wasn't even really considered a, a real or a proper instrument yet, so the great composers of the day weren't writing any music for it. But fortunately, someone did finally come along and, and turn it into a, a real instrument um, that was more comprehensive and, and versatile. And his name was Giuseppe Donati. He was an Italian who was a baker by trade and lived in a, a very small town called Budrio, which is about halfway between Florence and Venice. And it was a common practice back in those days for bakers to use their leftover ashes to make clay objects and toys. And he got his hands on one of these toy ocarinas and decided he could do a lot better than that. So fortunately, he did. And he created the first, um, this was in the middle of the 19th century that this happened, he created the first uh, ocarina that was uh, classical. It was chromatic and, and uh, concert pitched and uh, a real instrument. And he decided to name it Ocarina, which is Italian for little goose. And if you hold it up next to an ocarina, you can actually see that that is a great name for, for the instrument because it does look like a bird. So the name stuck, and he kept making his ocarinas, and eventually he took on an apprentice, and his apprentice continued his work. And today, six apprentices later, uh, the Ocarina di Budrio is still uh, a very proud tra tradition in Italy. And uh, there is a, a group called the GOB, which stands for Gruppo Ocarinistico Budris, and they are the official uh, ensemble that continue the tradition of playing ocarina music in Budrio. So every couple of years they have a big festival and aficionados and ocarina players from all over the world gather to play music together and it's a, it's a really wonderful occasion for the ocarina. But anyway, going back to my original point, because there isn't a lot of music composed for the ocarina, a lot of the music that ocarina players uh, like to play is music that was written for other instruments that they adapt to the ocarina. So there's a lot of beautiful music uh, written during the Renaissance that I think works really well for the ocarina. So I'm going to play uh, Flow My Tears by John Dowland. <laughs> 